Hello. Oh. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, also, thank you, everyone that is joining online or watching live stream or recording. Uh, this talk is highly available key cloak, uh, highly available identity and access management with key cloak uh, in the cloud. My name is Michal. Uh, I am one of the key cloak maintainers and I work for Red Hat. I need to mention that a previous version of this talk was presented a few weeks ago by my colleagues, Alexander and Ryan, and I'm reusing some of their slides. So let's jump ahead and let's start. Like, what is identity and access management and why, why do I need one? Basically, why do I need key cloak? Well, I think you need one or you should use it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so how does it work then? So you have your services, an API somewhere running. It would be still the same. Uh, it's up here, down. And then you have your, your users that are, that are joining uh, or, or accessing the pages that, that you uh, that you give them, basically. And if you use Key Cloak, you then have a third service that is Key Cloak running somewhere here. And uh, what then needs to be done is that your users are authenticating against Key Cloak as, uh, as the first thing. So they share the credentials with Key Cloak. Uh, so it can be username and password, but it can be also something else depending on your use case. Uh, and then Key Cloak provides tokens with, uh, to users. And these users then can access the, these resources and send the token there. And there are, the resources need to be then able to verify whether the token is valid or not. So they again talk to Keycloak and verify the token. And Keycloak then responds to them, okay, yes, I know this user, uh, their username is this, uh, email is this, and so on and so on. You can configure what the token contains. Uh, and now, okay, so you have this setup, but what are the benefits? So first thing is uh, that you need to authenticate only once per day. And this doesn't mean once per day for each application, but once per day overall across all the applications, because then the tokens can be distributed across all your, uh, all your applications and all can verify that tokens are valid or not. This is called single sign-on, by the way. Uh, you can also integrate Keycloak with LDAP and Kerberos, uh, you can also configure brokering to existing OIDC and SAML, uh, SAML services. So this means these are these buttons login with Facebook or Google and this kind of stuff. Uh, and you can also integrate Keycloak with existing uh, database. So if you have your users already stored somewhere, you can teach Keycloak how to communicate with this database. It requires a little bit of development and you need to uh, upload these, this piece of code as extension to Keycloak, but it works. So the basic login form looks like this. Uh, you have the username and password. This is all provided by Keycloak by default. And with a little bit of tuning, it can look like this. So you have the login with GitHub, Google, or whatever you configure. We have this documented. Uh, and then you fill username and passwords the same way as before if you are using LDAP, for example, because Keycloak then checks all the sources of users for you based, uh, like it goes through the, all, through the old sources and choose the, the one that contains the user. Um, and Keycloak also helps you, helps you eliminate some daily churn. So you don't need to do some housekeeping anymore because uh, users can recover their passwords uh, on their own. You don't need to uh, like solve any tickets for that or they don't need to create any ticketing, uh, ticket in ticketing systems. Uh, they can configure a second factor authentication themselves uh, and you can make it compulsory for each user, for example. Uh, they can self-register, so if you want to allow users to self-register, you can click a button uh, in, in the admin console and uh, it will be available in the login screen. And they can manage their data on their own, so they can change also their emails, they can change their first name, last name, and so on. So then the login form would look like this. Uh, you see that there is a forgot, forgot password and register buttons. Uh, Okay, that's nice, so maybe you created this setup, you are happy with that. However, Keycloak is now a critical uh, component of your infrastructure. Um, here, I would like to share a funny story with you. So, some time ago, when we were doing our regular bug triaging uh, with my team, we came across this bug, and the reporter was complaining that Keycloak is not starting, and as an expected behavior, uh, they, they feel that uh, Keycloak should start with no excuses. And this was a little bit funny to read it that way, uh, in the ticket, however, 
Uh, this person is correct, because you are relying on key clock a lot, and you want it to be available 24 seven. Like otherwise, if, if key clock is down, your services are not accessible, uh, they, they cannot log in, uh, the, the services cannot verify tokens, so they are probably pissed off. And that's why we started uh, about a year ago a journey where we wanted to provide high, highly available key clock deployments. Uh, and this was quite a journey, and this started with something like that. So this was available even before. Um, so you have N key clock pods, uh, and you have, in each key clock pod, there is an infinite span running. So infinite span is something for storing data in memory. And then we have also persistent, session, persistent state, and the persistent state then contains data uh, that are stored in database. So we use database for uh, less frequently used objects and infinite span for frequently used objects like sessions. Uh, and this is to make sure that the, the data uh, are accessed quickly, basically. Uh, so if you have more pods, you have then some uh, clustering, uh, you have some, the sessions are replicated ac across all key clock pods. Uh, this is done by InfiniSpan. Uh, and yeah, it's 2024, so you probably deploy this in Kubernetes, also depending uh, based on the conference we are at. Uh, and thanks to that, you are then able to tolerate a node pod failure. So this is, uh, this is already a highly available setup because you are resilient to a pod failure. However, uh, there is still one problem with that, and it is that, uh, uh, it is that your Kubernetes workers are usually running in single availability zone. And like depending on your cloud provider, it can happen that the availability zone goes down as well. Uh, and therefore, we decided for our journey to tolerate uh, availability zone failures. So the idea is simple. Okay, let's have two key clock sites into availability zone. So let's say in availability zone one, uh, well, uh, let's call it site one and in availability zone two, there is a site two. And the setup is the same as I showed you before. Uh, and this would solve the issue. However, this brings also a lot of new issues that we need to solve, right? Because we need to somehow maintain the, the, the state between sites. So for both the session state and the persistent state. Uh, to relax this setup a little bit, we decided to start with, the, with an active passive setup. This means that uh, one side is marked as active, the other is marked as passive. Uh, and then all the user requests are handled only by the active side. Uh, this simplification is, was really necessary for us, for us in the beginning because this greatly simplifies the write semantics because if you think about it, the flow of data is from users to active side of key clock, and then the data are then trickling down to, to the passive side uh, down there. Uh, and as you would probably guess, uh, in case of failover of the availability zone, we will redirect the users to, to the previously passive side. Uh, so for that, we need to solve a few issues. So first issue is how to manage user connections. Right? And for that, we chose to use AWS Route 53 load balancer. And the idea is like this. Okay, so let's route all our users through Route 53. And then Route, route 53 uh, determines which site is active and redirect all the users only to the active site. Uh, however, Route 53 needs to also know about when the site goes down. So it needs to have some health checks to key cloak, so, so it's listening on key cloak or periodically checking whether key cloaks are up or down. And if key cloak inactive site is down, uh, the, the switch is done and the users are redirected to the site too. Uh, one problem with that is that uh, root 53 is DNS load balancer. This means that the, the record in DNS is changed when this change, when the failover happens and it can cause some problems if some clients are caching the DNS uh, resolves, basically. So the failover can take some time for, a little bit more time for some clients that are doing the DNS caching. Another issue is 
uh, the session failover, or the second issue that we need to solve was session failover. Now, this was a trickiest part, because remember, as I said, that these data are frequently uh, accessed, and it is therefore read and write heavy. Uh, and for that, we chose InfiniSpan. So we were using InfiniSpan for a long time, and we were happy about it, so we also decided to use it in our uh, highly available setup. Uh, I mentioned InfiniSpan already, but I didn't explain what it is. So what it is is it's in-memory key value cache store with advanced clustering capabilities. So what this means is that uh, when we are storing something, uh, a session data, a piece of session data in InfiniSpan, InfiniSpan ensures that this piece of data uh, is stored in at least two key clock nodes. And thanks to that, we are resilient to the pod failure, as I, as I mentioned before. So we don't need to solve anything, we are just putting things to InfiniSpan, and it is ensured for us. Uh, they also provide a Kubernetes operator, and it is an open source project, of course. And it uh, supports two modes. So one mode is embedded mode, that was the one that I mentioned before. So your InfiniSpan is running within your application, or it's sharing the same uh, memory space and sharing the CPUs. But it also supports something called client-server mode, uh, so this is then InfiniSpan is deployed separately in its own pods, and your application is running in its own pods. And they are communicating via some protocol, so they support Redis, uh, HTTP, or their own hot rod protocol. So let's have a look how InfiniSpan can help us uh, with solving the session failover. So the idea is, okay, let's have the InfiniSpan cluster spawned in each availability, in each availability zone as well. And let's configure the, the cross-site replication support they have. So what cross-site replication does is that you can have two independent InfiniSpan clusters, but they are somehow connected between each other. So whenever you write something into InfiniSpan in one site, it is automatically uh, uh, written also to the second availability zone. And that's what we used. And also we need to use uh, synchronous replication and the thing, and the reason behind it is because Keyclog is a security product and it is doing, a, uh, for example, logouts and logins. And we need to make sure that, for example, during failover, if something uh, is written to the site one, we need to make sure that it is written also to site two. So the users are creating something inside site one uh, and writes, in Keyclog writes it to an external InfiniSpan and it's trickling down to the second InfiniSpan and only then uh, we are re re replying to user with a, with a response. Uh, InfiniSpan also provides uh, admin uh, operations on the external InfiniSpan. And this is necessary for failover, during failover, because if site one goes down and you start it up again, the InfiniSpan and key clothes are empty. Uh, and you need to, because it's stored, everything is stored in memory, so if you start it again, everything is empty, and you need to do a state transfer between each site, uh, and only then you can redirect users back to the, active, to the previously active site. And uh, this is also possible using InfiniSpan. Uh, so as, and as a side effect, uh, the session data now survives key clock pause restarts. So this means that you can, you can lose even all key clock nodes in both availability zones, but if InfiniSpan is up, the sessions are still there and users do not need to log in again. So the third, third issue is database failover. Uh, so we need to ensure the same as for InfiniSpan, uh, for session data, also for the persistent data. And for that, we leveraged Aurora database from AWS, uh, as, like more specifically, it's Postgres flavor. And the idea is pretty similar to the previous one. So in the same availability zone as uh, Active Key Cloak, we have an Aurora writer instance, uh, which is then handling all the writes and reads. Uh, but we have also a reader instance in the site two, or availability zone two, uh, that is then listening on all changes that are happening in the, the writer instance. And in case of failover, uh, the writer instance or the reader instance is promoted to a new writer instance, and uh, uh, then all writes are going there. The failover takes around one minute, which is not uh, 
which is not really a small amount of time, uh, but it's better than waiting for all your key clock pods to start again. One disadvantage is that you need to have an AWS JDBC wrapper installed on your key clocks, because otherwise the failover takes a little longer. So when the failover happens, all key clock nodes need to drop their JDBC connections and use a new one to the, to the new writer instance. And if, if the state somehow allows to keep the previous connections, it's bad because key clock cannot do anything and it's just uh, throwing exceptions. But apart from that, no additional key cloak changes are required. So the whole architecture overview is like this. So we have the availability zone one. We have our users going to root 53, redirected to key cloak, doing changes in InfiniSpan or Aurora database. The data are trickling down to the availability zone two, uh, to either Aurora DB or InfiniSpan. And in case of failover, we are switching the switch <laughs> and redirecting all users to the previously passive site. Well, so that's it, that's the setup. Uh, and here are some uh, things to share, some surprising system behavior that we encountered. So first thing is uh, that we need, needed to enable load shedding. Uh, so previously, before that, what, what was happening is that Keycloak was queuing all the requests that were coming into one long queue. And if, if we were, uh, if we were getting more requests than we are able to handle, this queue were like increasing a lot. And that was causing problems. So first of all, the clients were waiting for timeouts or were waiting for their requests just to see timeout except some timeout. And uh, the memory usage of key clock was increasing. So the remedy is, okay, let's drop the requests if uh, the queue is full. So we have some maximum queue length, let's say 1000. And if there is 1000 requests in the queue, the, the 1,000 first will be dropped. Um, so th this helps key clock with less memory uh, consumption, and also this helps users because they, they see uh, quickly that the, the system is under load and they need to try again. Another issue was cache stampede. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that term. I was not before we encountered it. And the thing is that uh, when you start a new key clock node, it has empty caches. So we are caching the calls to the database, so we are not going there so often. Uh, but if you start a new node, uh, the caches are empty. And when the new node receives, let's say, 100 requests in one second, and we, uh, we handle 20 uh, requests at the same time in 20 threads, it can happen that all of the threads are going to the database for the same resource. Uh, because what they do, they will check, okay, is this entry in cache? No, it's not, I'm going to the database. And if they are doing it concurrently, they can, all of them can get missed in the cache. Uh, so the remedy was, okay, introduce some JVM level locking. So if one thread is going to the database for entry with this ID, let's wait for that uh, request, not go to database as well. Uh, the first thing was uh, blocking probes and metrics. So this was a little bit embarrassing in the beginning when we started because uh, like we are trying to be good Kubernetes citizens and probes and metrics are probably something that you want to provide. Uh, but what, we, what was happening to us in the beginning was that uh, during overload situation, during high load, uh, our, our nodes or pods were sometime, sometimes restarted. And that's probably something you don't want to because then other nodes will have a really hard time and restart probably to, uh, too. And this was happening for a few reasons. So first thing was that we had blocking probes. So the probes were waiting for the database or doing some request to the database and waiting for some operation to finish. And they were sharing the connections with other request processing as well. Uh, another thing was that these requests were somehow sometimes load shedded after we introduced the load shedding. Uh, and it were enqueued or before load shedding, these requests were enqueued into same queue, uh, which were causing timeouts. So the remedy was, okay, let's not block probes. Uh, let's not enqueue them under overload situation and never load shed them. And the same for metrics, okay? Uh, during this journey, we had some, uh, some good habits that really helped us uh, being successful. So first thing is, okay, let's have up-to-date documentation during whole, whole journey. 
So we have a project called Keyclock Benchmark, and this Keyclock Benchmark contains all the details about the setup I just explained, uh, described, uh, and it has three main things. So first thing is, uh, it contains documentation about how to deploy Keyclock in Kubernetes, uh, then how to create data set in it. So if you want to do some performance testing, you probably don't want to have only one user uh, and one client, one application. You want to create 100,000 users and do the testing. Uh, so this is, uh, we have a data set provider that uh, you can use for that and it is documented in this documentation. And it also helps you to run load on that. Uh, so you can, you can check how to run load and how to see the results. We use ephemeral environments. Uh, so this means the idea is, okay, you can have as many environments as you want. However, you need to be prepared that you are losing these environments uh, at the end of the day. So this helped us a lot because we didn't have any issues with some stale environments or some issues caused by long running environments. Uh, and we were really happy about it. And third thing was uh, measure, record, and repeat. Uh, you know how it is. You are doing two steps forward, one step back. So you need to be prepared for that. Uh, so we needed to, do, to add metrics collections and have searchable logs because if some issue happens, we need to be able to quickly investigate the issue, so see the metrics, uh, what's happening, uh, and see key clock logs. We also needed to capture all insights uh, after the run because as I said, we are using the ephemeral environments. Uh, so we need to be able to capture all the, all the metrics, we need to capture the results because we need to be able to compare results from one month ago with today's results, for example, if something changes. Uh, and we also need to measure, doing, do the measuring very often. Uh, so we have nightly runs for performance and functional tests. Uh, well, this proved to be really useful a few weeks ago when uh, Keyclog main changed the default hashing algorithm. Uh, and the default is now Argon2, and Argon2 has really high memory consumption. If completely broke, which completely broke our garbage collection. Uh, so we see a really huge performance drop and we need to solve it. Uh, if we wouldn't have these performance tests, we would probably release new key clock version and only then we would do some performance tests or there will be some users that are, well, not very happy about the performance of new release. And we would need to do to the fix really quickly. Well, this way we were able to, to fix that before the release. Here are some tools that we were using. Uh, so, of course, Kubernetes. We are using OpenShift on AWS. Uh, we are deploying everything using GitHub Actions. So in Keyclock Benchmark, uh, we have a lot of GitHub Actions workflows. So each of our team member can come to GitHub Action uh, and create an environment for, for them. So they can say, okay, I want an ev two environments in this region, in these two, two availability zones. Uh, and then deploy Keycloak with these settings there and uh, do a performance test on it and return me the results. So we were very, really happy about the GitHub Actions, how it worked. We are using Helm for templating, so you can quickly do some change. You can change uh, some variable, some input to Helm, uh, run Helm again, and everything is updated for you uh, very simply. We are, uh, we are using Gatling for load running. Uh, we are using Grafana for displaying the metrics, and we are adding some additional instrumentation to, or some additional metrics uh, via open telemetry as well. So now this is what we have. Uh, this is uh, already supported in Kiko 24. Uh, it is supported also in 25. But what's the future about it? What we plan for future? Uh, so first thing that is, uh, this is a little bit closer future because this will be released in Keycloak 25 already uh, as a preview feature though. Uh, and it is persistent sessions. So uh, if you are using Keycloak, you are probably familiar with the fact that if you restart all your, all your Keycloak pods, you are losing sessions. However, uh, with this feature enabled, the sessions are stored also in the database. Uh, and thanks to that, uh, the sessions are persisted across restarts. That's first thing. Another thing is that if we have the sessions in the database, we can then limit the number of sessions in memory, which means we have less memory consumption. And thanks to that, we have also better scaling. Uh, well, the reason for that is that 
if you have, let's say, 20 million sessions in InfiniSpan across six of your pods, uh, and you are adding a new one, uh, you need to do a rebalancing on, uh, on, if new pod joins the cluster, you need to do some rebalancing which can take some time. However, with this uh, feature, we have the maximum number of session 10,000, but you can change it, uh, just for caching purposes, uh, and therefore the scaling is better. So if you are interested in that, there, here is a GitHub discussion that you can join. You can see how to enable this feature, how to run it. Uh, well, you can test it and give us feedback. We would really appreciate it. Uh, it's preview feature, but we would like to work hard on that to make it available for you in next release uh, in full. Yep. By the way, this will be preview in Kiko 25 that was not yet released, but it's just probably around the corner. Let's see how it goes. And now there is a little bit further future that we are still considering, and here are some ideas. So, okay, this was active passive setup. Uh, so let's have a look at active active, uh, what we can do there. We have already some proof of concept. We have some steps that we want to evaluate and test, and, but we need to see what are the benefits of that, because maybe the benefits wouldn't overweight to additional cost or additional uh, work we need to do. So we need to decide whether go this way or not. Uh, we, need, we can also simplify the deployments and the blueprints that we have in uh, Kiklo benchmark document or in high availability documentation. Uh, um, we did some simplification already because in 23 it was preview, in 24 it is supported, so we did some simplification there. We did also some simplification from 24 to 25, so uh, it will be released soon. Uh, another thing, another thing that we can provide is adding support for additional cloud providers and databases. So, so far in Kiko 25, it will be or it is only AWS and Aurora database. However, we can um, maybe some companies or users have some legal requirements for, or they are used to using an other cloud provi provider uh, and other database. So maybe this is another way that we can have a look. Uh, and we are security products, so we, we can provide some security hardened bl blueprints as well. Uh, here are some links. So here is the, the first one is the main Keyclock web page, keyclock.org. Uh, you can find there also uh, our key main Keyclock repository. We have 20,000 20, stars. So <laughs> if, you, if you want to add uh, another one, we would really appreciate it. Um, then there is a Keyclock ben benchmark project. Uh, this is the documentation, uh, so you can see all the three main pillars there. Uh, then there is high availability guide, which contains all the building blocks uh, about how to set up the how to set up the deployment that I just explained. All the steps you need to do. Uh, we have Key Clock Book. Uh, now it's second edition because we switched the environment from uh, from Wildfly to Quarkus. So the second edition is upgraded uh, to contain information about Quarkus. Uh, and here is also the link for InfiniSpan. Uh, so you can go to their page and see uh, whether you can maybe use it in your project as well, because we were really happy about how it works. Uh, here are my contact information if you are interested to get in touch. Uh, you can also use CNCF Slack channel. We are, our team is available there. Uh, we have also some channels, so uh, you can contact us. Uh, and here is a QR code for the slides if you are interested. Uh, scan it, you can then find all the links there. Uh, uh, and that's pretty much it from me. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, so we have a bunch of questions, so let's start. <clears throat> so does Keylog uh, implement a ABEC fine-graded permissions? Um, well, think, yeah. yeah, we have some authorization. We have authorization services, so you can go to for each client. You can configure some uh, some authorization, so you have uh, resources there, and then you can configure some policies, and then your application can do some uh, requests uh, to Keyclog and check whether this user has access or not, and uh, you the, the your application can then do this decision whether to uh, show the resources or not. Perfect. When do you expect that the key clock will stop releasing major versions uh, so often um, to not break, um, to not have a such uh, uh, breaking compatibilities? 
Um, well, like this question is like twofold, right? Uh, well, if we don't release that often, we cannot have the updates for you that often. Uh, I'm not sure this is currently on our radar to slow down, uh, but uh, yeah, not, not sure what else would I say. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> Maybe next year. Uh, what about the master slowdown because of synchronization of the session writes? Uh, is it a too big deal? Did you have a look at it? Um, master slowdown? Yeah, I, I guess uh, the question is about the database, which mm. uh, had the persisted the sessions and when it's syncing the, the data. Yeah, okay, well, with persistent sessions, you are paying also, uh, you are paying something for going to the database more often, so you will have more uh, database usage, well, uh, of course, that's expected. However, uh, the benefits for of lower memory usage and uh, not losing sessions may be higher. It depends on your setup. So if you don't want to use persistent sessions, you can still keep uh, the setup as we have now. But we will be working on the performance, so it is as performant as before. But uh, yeah, at the moment, it, there is some penalty, of course. So considering Keylog is a such a critical component as a part of your and deployment. What are the best practices, how you do, uh, handle audit and un admin events? Uh, what is the best practice uh, there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, well, Keyclock provides events out of the box. You can enable them in the admin console for each realm. Uh, and it's, it is also possible to configure your custom uh, event listeners. This means that you, again, do some de development, you deploy something as an extension to Keycloak, and then Keycloak will send uh, your events, for example, to Kafka or wherever you want them to be. Uh, is it the best practice to have a separate infinite, infinite span pod from the Keycloak servers or? Um, well, we received already this question a few times. Um, so the thing is that you are, you are getting some value of having the external infinite span. Uh, the thing is that the main part is the admin operations that I mentioned. So you need to be able to, for example, push state or during failover, you need to do some synchronization between sites, which would not be, wouldn't be that easy if we are using only Keycloak InfiniSpan. Uh, yeah, it is somehow possible. There are some ways some users are using it already. However, uh, we decided to be on safe site and, and keep the external InfiniSpan. Perfect. Uh, any guidelines on uh, sizing the Kubernetes deployment, or maybe I will add, uh, does, it, uh, does your operator handle it? Um, well, we have a sizing guide as part of the highly available documentation. There is a sizing guide that says, okay, if, I ha if you have, uh, so for all 150 uh, logins per second at, I don't know, three CPUs in three node cluster or something like that, you can have a look at it, there is a link, uh, so you can follow this sizing guide, and we will be uh, updating this sizing guide based on the, based on the performance that we are receiving every day. That's what I mentioned. Perfect. We have seen uh, your plans for future development of the HA setup. Are there any significant features outside of that? Yes, for sure, yeah. Uh, so, um, we have a lot of improvements in authentication and protocols, so one team is working on that. Uh, we have OAuth SIG group, uh, SIG, OAuth SIG, uh, well, that's the name for it, sorry. So there is a OAuth SIG group that you can join their meetings and uh, follow what, what, are, what are the newest changes in authentication protocol and what's happening in Keycloak. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, well, we are always improving our UI so they are uh, user-friendly and so they adapt to new things. Uh, well, we re recently we released something called User Profile, which allows you to configure, uh, on your realm level, you can configure some uh, requirements for user attributes, for example. So you can then say, okay, so each user needs to specify this address. Uh, and then they can go into their account console and fill that address, or it can be asked for, uh, in registration form, uh, and this kind of stuff. Perfect. Uh, maybe last question. So this is specific about the Route 53. Mm -hmm. um, is, is it specific uh, key lock deployment? Can I use my own? And I guess the same goes for the database. Mm -hmm. Well. These blueprints contains things that we are testing. Uh, 
uh, and that we support basically. We say that this works for us, we are testing it every day. Of course, you can use your own load balancer or your own, own database, but this can bring uh, an issues, or it, this can bring issues. Uh, and then we wouldn't be that, uh, if we don't have knowledge in something, we are not uh, You basically cannot available. support them, yeah, right? We cannot, we are not available for you that much as with these environments that we can, because if you report some issue with Aurora database, we can, basically uh, next day spawn this environment and test it based on your in issue report. However, if there is some setup that we don't have, uh, it would be hard for us to, to fix this issue for you, or harder. Perfect, we are out of time, so thank you very much. We will answer the rest of the questions uh, online. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.